99% of developers don't get hashing. Can you even call yourself a developer if you can't explain the difference between SHA-256 and MD5? Are you able to describe the low-level details of hashing and how it powers blockchains and version control systems like Git? If you care about data structures and algorithms at all and want a more concrete understanding of security fundamentals, this is the video for you. Let's break down exactly what hashing is so you don't think it's just limited to hash tables and checksums. Even if you're 6'7", 260 pounds, rich and famous, you should still care about hashing. We'll learn about the universe of concepts surrounding pre-image and collision resistance, the avalanche effect, SHA-256, and break down hashing at a deeper level. Let's get started. The first thing you want to do to break down any complex computer science topic is to begin with a concrete definition. Hashing is the process of transforming data of any size into a fixed size output using a mathematical function known as a hash function. The resulting value, called a hash or digest, acts like a digital fingerprint for the input data. It uniquely represents the content without revealing the original data itself. One key feature of hashing is that the output length is constant, no matter the size of the input. For example, SHA-256 always produces a 256-bit, 64-character hexadecimal hash, whether you're hashing a single letter, a full paragraph, or an entire gigabyte-sized file. A strong hash function possesses several critical properties that make it secure and reliable. This section is very important. First, it is deterministic, meaning the same input always produces the same hash. This can be expressed mathematically as the following. For example, hashing the string hello with SHA-256 produces a consistent hash value. Second, it is pre-image resistant. So it is computationally infeasible to reverse a hash to obtain the original input, meaning that given a hash value y, it is computationally infeasible to find an x such that this equation holds. In other words, knowing the hash does not allow you to reconstruct or reverse engineer the original input. Third, it is second pre-image resistant, meaning that even knowing one input and its hash, it's nearly impossible to find a different input that produces the same hash. It formalizes the property that given an input x1, it is infeasible to find a different input x2 does not equal to x1 satisfying the following. And fourth, it is collision resistant. So the likelihood of two distinct inputs producing the same hash is astronomically low. It is extremely difficult to find any two distinct inputs x1 and x2 satisfying the following. But later in this video, I'll discuss why MD5 no longer satisfies this property. Finally, I'm going to discuss one of the most important properties. A strong hash demonstrates an avalanche effect, where even a tiny change to the input, like flipping a single bit, results in a completely different hash, making patterns in the data undetectable. This can be expressed in probabilistic terms using the strict avalanche criterion, or SAC, which is a formalization of the avalanche effect. For any input x and a single bit modified input x prime, each bit of the output hash should change with probability approximately 0.5. In other words, the strict avalanche criterion is satisfied if whenever a single input bit is complemented, each of the output bits changes with a 50% probability. This guarantees that even tiny changes to the input completely scrambles the output, making patterns or relationships in the input nearly impossible to detect from the hash itself. Together, these Properties, determinism, pre-image resistance, second pre-image resistance, collision resistance, and the avalanche effect form the foundation for cryptographic security and hashing. But you might be wondering from a practical standpoint, how is hashing actually used? Well, let me answer that. In data integrity, hashes allow us to detect tampering. If you download a file and its hash doesn't match the expected value, the file has been altered. Blockchains create a tamper-proof ledger by including the hash of the previous block's header within each new block, forming a cryptographic chain where any past modification would invalidate all subsequent blocks. In version control systems like Git, each commit is identified by a SHA-1 hash calculated not just from the code changes but from a commit object containing metadata and the hashes of the parent commits, guaranteeing the integrity of the entire project history. I'll touch on some of the increasing vulnerabilities of SHA-1 due to collision attacks later in this video, which is why Git is transitioning to SHA-2. And on that note, checksums use algorithms like SHA-256 to create a file's fingerprint for integrity checks, and hash tables leverage a hash function to map keys to array indices for data retrieval in constant average time or O of 1. There are multiple families of hash functions, each designed with different trade-offs between speed, security, and implementation complexity. MD5, or Message Digest Algorithm 5, for example, was once extremely popular for checksums and verifying file integrity. MD5 is a one-way cryptographic hash function that creates a 128-bit hash value, often displayed as a 32-character hexadecimal number. But it is now considered broken because researchers have demonstrated practical collision attacks, meaning they can generate two different inputs that produce the same hash, undermining its reliability for security. 
Sha-1, designed as MD-5's successor, provided stronger resistance for a time but also has been deprecated after large-scale collision demonstrations. For example, the 2017 shattered attack by Google researchers. The attack specifically created two PDF files that were different but had the same Sha-1 hash. But how about hashing functions that actually work? SHA-2, which includes variants like SHA-224, SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512, remains the workhorse of modern cryptography today, securing web traffic through TLS or SSL, underpinning digital signatures, and even powering the consensus mechanisms in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where SHA-256 is used for mining. SHA-3, built on the Kachak algorithm, was chosen through an open National Institutes of Standards and Technology competition, which is used to solicit, evaluate, and standardize new cryptographic algorithms or standards, just like the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. SHA-3 was chosen as the next generation standard for post-quantum cryptography. It's structurally different from SHA-2, using a sponge construction instead of the Merkle Damgard design, making it more resistant to certain theoretical attack vectors. And before we dive into how hashes actually work under the hood, this is the perfect place to thank the sponsor of today's video, Clerk. Because here's the thing, hashing and salting, these are fascinating to understand, but they're also incredibly easy to get wrong in production. And when it comes to security, getting things wrong isn't just a bug, it's a potential data breach. And that's where Clerk comes in. Clerk is basically authentication as a service built for modern apps. Instead of cobbling together your own login flows, password salting and hashing, JWT handling and session logic, you just integrate Clerk's SDK and get a full auth stack that works out of the box. They cover everything. Sign up and sign in flows, secure password storage with modern algorithms, salting and key stretching, token refresh cycles, multi-factor authentication, and even social login providers like Google, GitHub, and Apple. Under the hood, Clerk handles the messy cryptographic details and lifecycle management, so you don't have to worry about which hash algorithm to use, how to rotate tokens, or whether your implementation is exposing you to brute force or replay attacks. And the best part is they don't just stop at authentication. Clerk also gives you user management features. Things like user profiles, organization support, and role-based access controls without forcing you to reinvent that layer. It's designed with developers in mind. Flexible enough to integrate deeply if you need control, but also plug and play so you can get started very fast. If you've ever spent hours hacking together a custom auth system, you know how painful it can be. Clerk removes that burden entirely. So if you'd rather spend your time building features than worrying about whether your hashing or auth logic is airtight, definitely check out Clerk. They've already solved these problems for you. Link is in the pinned comment down below. Now back to the video. When it comes to password hashing, however, general purpose algorithms like SHA-256 are actually too efficient. Modern CPUs, GPUs, and even ASICs can compute billions of SHA-256 hashes per second, which makes brute forcing or dictionary attacks far too practical. To counter this, specialized password hashing algorithms are used. Bcrypt, one of the earliest, is based on the Blowfish cipher and incorporates a random salt in the hashing process. The key part is that it includes configurable work factors to slow down hashing. This work factor enables adjusting the complexity of a security measure to increase or decrease the effort an adversary needs to overcome it. Scrypt improves on this by being both CPU and memory intensive, forcing attackers to require far more hardware resources to scale their cracking attempts. So realistically, attackers have to build custom chips like ASICs with large RAM resources to crack Scrypt. But for Bcrypt, it's more vulnerable to specialized hardware like GPUs that are designed for high speed but low memory operations. The most modern standard, Argon2, which was the winner of the password hashing competition, is tunable across three different dimensions. Time cost, memory cost, and degree of parallelism allowing developers to strike a balance between user experience and brute force resistance. These algorithms are designed not just to hash passwords, but to make guessing them economically infeasible for attackers, even with very powerful hardware. Now I'm going to talk about a very important point. A crucial distinction is that hashing is one way. Unlike encryption, there is no key to reverse a hash back into its original input. However, attackers can still attempt dictionary or brute force attacks by hashing large lists of candidate inputs. To defend against this, systems use a SALT, a random value unique to each password, ensuring that identical passwords hash to different values and defeating pre-computed rainbow table attacks, which is a type of password cracking that uses a pre-computed table of hash values and their corresponding plain text passwords. The typical life cycle for securing a password with hashing looks something like this. The user enters a password, the system combines it with a randomly generated salt, and then a slow memory hard hash function like bcrypt or argon2 processes it, and the result is stored in the database along with the salt. On login, the system repeats the process and compares the hashes to authenticate the user. But how is a hash or digest actually generated from an input? 
Cryptographic hash functions transform input data into a fixed size output, often using a structure like the Merkle Damgard construction. The Merkle Damgard construction is a cryptographic method for building hash functions that can handle arbitrary length inputs from a simpler fixed length compression function. It's a foundational design for many popular hash algorithms like MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. The process begins by padding the input data to ensure its length is a multiple of a specific block size, for example, 512 bits for SHA-256. The operation begins with a fixed algorithm-specific initial value known as the internal state. The core of the function is a compression algorithm that processes the input one block at a time. For every single block, it combines the current internal state with the data block, performing a complex series of bitwise operations, such as shifts, rotations, XORs, and modular addition, to produce a new scrambled internal state. This sequential processing is what creates the avalanche effect, where a minor change in the input cascades through these operations to drastically alter the final hash. After the final data block is processed, a last transformation is applied to the internal state, which is then presented as the final hash value. Password-oriented algorithms like bcrypt or argon2 build on this by deliberately adding slow, memory-intensive steps to make brute force attacks computationally infeasible by increasing the cost of testing each guess. This block-by-block -block processing model is why hashes are deterministic. The same input yields the same output, yet they're effectively irreversible. If you want to begin your path on becoming a 10x developer and learn how to build Docker, Redis, compilers, and Git from scratch, I highly recommend that you check out CodeCrafters down below. This is the absolute best project-based learning platform. And if you want to use one of the best authentication as a service platforms out there and spend way less time building custom auth systems, I recommend that you check out Clerk in the description and the pinned comment down below. As always, thank you very much for watching today's video and happy coding.